Hello and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Anna, and I'm here with my two friends, Will and Ant. Hello. Hi. This week, we are in the year 1881, which mm-hmm. is an incredible relief after last week's episode of <laughs> 910 BCE. <laughs> that was a travesty. It was. You know, I am proud of what we came up with. <laughs> I just, the, there's nothing we can do if we come to anywhere close yeah. to that number again, because yeah. we've literally done all the history that existed then. People really should have written more things down <laughs> in anticipation of future podcasts. I'm disappointed yeah, at people I agree, then. I agree. Yeah. And got them on Wikipedia straight away. Yeah, I mean, Wikipedia <laughs> definitely existed in the... 10th, 9th, 10th century BC. That's right. <laughs> um, great. So today, 1881, easy peasy, mm-hmm. lemon squeezy, oh, history yeah. just fallen out of every hole. Uh, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Sorry. There has to have been a better way to say that. <laughs> All the history holes. Um, <laughs> moving on, do you both have your three word summaries? I do. Yes. Will, you want to go first? Yes, absolutely. Cowboy, lawman, gunfight. <laughs> Good. <laughs> this is about the Congress of Vienna. <laughs> uh, Ant? Uh, world's worst camouflage. World's worst camouflage. <laughs> okay. Uh, mine is job or death. <laughs> That's the Massachusetts uh, <laughs> state flag. That right? was yeah. how Elon Musk did the Twitter firings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's also just the only thing it says on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, with those very clear summaries, we'll go ahead and get straight to it. All right. I, today, am talking about the assassination of President James A. Garfield. Hmm. Yes. And I had... By lasagna? (laughs) Yes, good. Check. One uh, Garfield joke out of the way. I had kind of resisted this because Garfield is one of the presidents in the era of forgettable presidents, I believe. There's like an actual thing that we (laughs) call American history. Um, (laughs) But it turns out that this is a fascinating story. So I'm really glad that I looked into it. So uh, quick background. There was an election in 1880. And this is 15 years after the Civil War ends. Um, Ulysses Grant yeah. was the front runner for the Republican nomination. He had, of course, been the victorious general yeah, in the Civil yeah. War, and he'd already been president for two terms. Uh, but this is before we had term limits. And Grant was supported by what was called the stalwart faction of the Republican Party, the stalwarts. This is back in the day when they had really good Yeah, nicknames. good names. Will, yeah. Will, who did you vote for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was Grant through and through, actually. Yeah, I, I did yeah. some fundraising for him yeah. at the time. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah, in you Boston. were responsible with coming up for his campaign jingles, weren't you? That's right. Did, yeah. you, did you want to sing yeah, one Do you want to sing one Yeah, I'd come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, so as Will knows, but I'll tell the rest of you, the rival Republican faction was known as the Half-Breeds, <laughs> which... <laughs> do they call themselves that? <laughs> they call themselves that. I, let's just assume it has some really horrible overtones. What were they half bred with? I think maybe it was something about like different planks of the party platform. Oh right, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, no, that not kind as of in thing. like not they were like, like alligator yes. humans. Oh yeah, they were all alligator <laughs> okay, humans, gotcha, but yeah. they yeah, they didn't like to talk about that. <laughs> uh, so you've got these two factions. Grant ends up losing the nomination to this guy James A. Garfield, who's a total dark horse. He wasn't affiliated with either faction. I think it's probable that. The two just sort of canceled each other out, leaving an opening for this total unknown. Um, And then he ended up winning. He narrowly beat his uh, his opponent on the other side, Winfield Scott Hancock. Oh, that's an alligator. I've ever heard one. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Winfield the alligator, hundred (laughs) percent. Okay, just gonna write that down for a children's TV idea. Um, So that's the background of the 1880 election, and now we meet. I mean, I guess he is the protagonist, but he's certainly not a hero. Uh, His name is Charles Guiteau. Uh, Charles Guiteau is a man who has worn many hats. He's uh, done theology, law. He was a bill collector. He spent time in the Oneida community, which is this failed utopian community that I will absolutely talk about on a future episode. (laughs) Incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bonkers. 
Guiteau supported Grant for president, and he wrote this whole big speech called Grant Against Hancock, explaining why he thought Grant should win. But then when Garfield got the Republican nomination instead, Guiteau basically just does like a find and replace and puts in (laughs) Guiteau for Grant throughout the whole thing and doesn't change the facts. So it's like... Garfield won the civil war for us. He should be president. It's like, no, mate, you that's he did something totally different. <laughs> uh, so, OK, strike one for Guito. He never even delivers the speech in public, but he gets hundreds of copies of it printed and incidentally does not pay the bill for the printing. Funny for a bill collector. <laughs> yeah, he's you'll see he's uh, he doesn't always follow through on his um, ideas, but he he distributes these and he believes that this speech is responsible for Garfield's eventual victory. Mm-hmm. Because of this, he demands to be made a consul, like, you know, an ambassador. Yeah, yeah. With a preference for Vienna, but also saying that he would settle for Paris. Okay. <laughs> you know, so totally reasonable. I get that. And the Republican Party establishment is like, sorry, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> but he keeps loitering around the Republican headquarters. He even goes into the White House to give his speech to Garfield. And it is uh, very important to know that at this point in history, presidents don't have bodyguards, American mm. presidents. The Secret Service doesn't exist. Or like locks. Or, lo- or like locks. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, just you. pretty much anybody could go into the White House. With a speech that's completely speech not based in fact. that's completely not based in fact, but, you know, was, yay, Garfield. I mean, that seems totally fine. <laughs> I'm not asking yeah, for any trouble at no all. No <laughs> problems there. Um, Lincoln, I guess, had some bodyguards during the Civil War, uh, but... They're, that's and their conclusion from that whole thing was, was that they didn't need them <laughs> yeah, anymore. I, I mean, I guess bodyguards didn't really work for Lincoln. So, and it's uh, like the Civil War's over, so there's just this sense of complacency, which becomes problematic, <laughs> as we will soon see. I, it also must be said that Guiteau is not a well man. Um, he is he is just really slipping into kind of mental instability. And his family had him committed a few years earlier, but he escaped from the asylum. And then he just sort of roamed around Washington, becoming increasingly destitute, but still demanding that he be rewarded for his help getting Garfield elected. Yeah. Uh, eventually, he gets banned from the White House. And then he runs into the Secretary of State, who tells him, never speak to me again on the Paris consulship as long as you live. <laughs> <laughs> but Vienna is still in play, yeah, right? Vienna, we still talk about. But you can just imagine what a pain he was being, can't yeah, you? Yeah. yeah. And this is when he decides that he's being commanded by God to kill the president. There we go. Oh, yeah. There it yeah. is. Logical conclusion. Yep. So he borrows some money from a relative and he goes out to buy a gun. <laughs> and uh, at the gun store, he's deciding between two, and he picks the one with a more ornate ivory inlaid handle because he thought it would look better in the museum exhibit after the assassination. That is real insane thinking. Yeah, this is like, he is he is so convinced that this is his mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't keep it a secret that he's planning this. He writes a letter to the general of the army asking for protection from the mob if he kills Garfield. Wow. He writes letters to Republican officials. He even writes one to Garfield himself demanding that he fire the secretary of state or, quote, your party will come to grief. He goes to the D.C. jail and asks for a tour of this facility because he wants to see where he'll be incarcerated. He follows Garfield around everywhere. He even follows him to the beach in New Jersey when he's on holiday. But he decides against killing him then because Garfield's with his wife, who's in poor health, and Guiteau doesn't want to add to her stress. <laughs> well, okay, fair one. Yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> so one. it's like all of this is completely ignored. I mean, you can imagine today at the very at one of these things, yeah, yeah, yeah. he would have been in prison forever, right? Yeah, but yeah, all yeah. of these things are just completely ignored. Then we get to July 1881. Garfield is leaving for a, a vacation. Another one. He hasn't been president that long. <laughs> um, it is known when he will be leaving. So Guiteau goes to the train station, shoots Garfield twice at point blank range from behind. Guiteau gets immediately apprehended. And at the police station, he keeps screaming that he's a stalwart and he wants Chester A. Arthur, the VP, to be president. 
And this makes people think for a minute that Arthur was behind it all, mm. which he wasn't. Oh, uh, uh, or uh, was he? No, pro- he, he probably wasn't. not. This, this guy <laughs> yeah. is like a mounting yeah, you totally. know, case of just crazy. <laughs> and Garfield survives the attack. He survives the oh. gunshots. He's taken back to the White House, but one of the bullets is lodged inside him, and the doctors aren't really sure where. And... Um, <laughs> I mean, I was going to say at this point it gets crazy, but it's already crazy. So it just keeps escalating. (laughs) At one point, Alexander Graham Bell of the telephone invents invents a metal detector to try to find the bullet. But the bed Garfield was on was made of metal. And also (laughs) Garfield's doctor wouldn't let Bell use the device on both sides of his body. Well, hang on. How long did he have to invent this thing? How long was Garfield lying there for? So like, like. Months. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, through the summer, he gets shot. I think in July. Yeah, July. Wow. Um, he doesn't die until September nineteenth. Seventy nine days. Wow. Yeah. So uh, Graham Bell invents the metal detector. The doctor <laughs> won't let him use it on both sides for some reason. What, what do you mean, as in front and like, back, uh, left no, and like right? right and left? What? Because the doctor is convinced the bullet is in the right side of Garfield's body. So he's like, sure, put your put your machine over the right side and he doesn't find it because the bullet is in the left but, side but also like body. let's quickly just do the left yeah. side anyway just in case no there's no time very like, bad <laughs> I'm a doctor I know what I'm talking about I don't know where it is but it's definitely on the right medical incompetence plays a big role <laughs> in what happens here so this is also before sterilization or any mm-hmm. sort of hygiene so doctors are just like sorry if you're squeamish putting their dirty hands into Garfield's body and and like rooting around to try to find the bullet. At one point, one of them uh, punctures his liver (laughs) through his examinations. Garfield gets a million different infections. Um, DC is a literal swamp. So they take him out of it because the heat is making everything worse. Mm -hmm. They move him to the seaside. But at this point he's got abscesses all over the place. He's septic. And eventually, yeah, September 19th, 79 days after he was shot, he dies. Yeah. Awful. So, so awful. And the thing so is, like, awful. had they not poked around inside him, he, he may have been exactly. fine. Exactly. And there's, like, there's a consensus today that, I mean, if this had happened now, he would have gone into surgery and yeah, been fine, right? They the would have used the metal detector on both sides. <laughs> they would, yeah, they would. Or they could have put him through a metal detector, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, and he would have been fine, but... You know, this is the 1880s, so sorry, Garfield. Um, But back to Guiteau, he goes on trial in November 81, and it's one of the first cases in U.S. history where insanity is considered as a plea. But Guiteau does not help his case because he says he was legally insane when he did the shooting because Mm -hmm. it was God's will and God was in control of his brain. (laughs) <laughs> but he is not medically insane. Oh, no. And his defense lawyers are like, please stop saying that. You're going to die. Um, here are some other things he does during his trial. He insults his defense team constantly. He gives his testimony in the form of epic poems. I actually quite like that. That's I do quite, like that's that quite as cool. well. I think that's fun. You know, if you're a jury, you're the judge, you heard so many different things yeah. and this guy comes in with like all his stanzas. He it's sounds amazing. so exhausting. <laughs> Just so exhausting. He's very Everything extra. Everything he does, yeah. Yeah. Um, he asks for legal advice from spectators in the audience by passing them notes, <laughs> <laughs> which is frowned upon as a, as a defense strategy. He dictates an autobiography to a newspaper and ends it with a personal ad for a nice Christian lady under 30. I have to say, he's a very charismatic assassin, isn't he? <laughs> he is. He's got, yeah. Did, did s- someone apply? Did he find a wife? <sighs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I I will assume that many women applied because you know, what else are you going to do? It's the eighties. If you're a woman that's listening to this podcast, which is probably <laughs> unlikely, uh, <laughs> please write in and let us know if you'd be willing to yeah. uh, date would be assassin, uh, actual assassin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean he's an influencer, so you could be famous. <laughs> and bear in mind, could... this guy speaks in verse. He does. Yeah, yeah he does. he's, he's, oh, he's very creative. That, he's... that Tinder profile would be <laughs> yeah, instant left. And then finally. And this is the one thing that I can actually kind of get behind. He says, the doctors killed Garfield. I just shot him. (laughs) 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 Which is like... Yeah. Not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I just pushed him off the cliff. Yeah, it was the exactly. ground yeah, that he the, hit. Yeah, the fall yeah, killed yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so that is the story of Charles Guiteau and James Garfield assassination. This being America, just one little footnote, it perhaps goes without saying, but uh, in addition to the trial, Guiteau was also prepping to run for president himself in 1884. Did he win? Good girl. Unfortunately, he was convicted and sentenced to death in 1882 Mm. before he could actually mount a campaign, uh, and he was hanged uh, in June 1882. Cheery. (laughs) All right. Yeah. I I know, but it was just like... You assume, you know, I think I knew that James Garfield was one of the presidents who got assassinated. I assume mm-hmm. somebody shot him and then he died, right? Like, yeah, but, and yeah. then it turns out to be this in- insane story. Uh, so many twists and turns. And when did the Secret Service, like, become a thing to protect the president? So not until, I think, the 20s. So the other presidents that were assassinated, so you've got Lincoln, and then 15 years later, you've got Garfield, Mm. 16 years later, and then uh, McKinley in the early, right around the turn of the century. And it was after McKinley that they said, okay, uh, maybe some secret, maybe secret service is a thing. I think you should include in that list of assassinated presidents, Guiteau, because I'm pretty sure he would have won. He definitely (laughs) would. (laughs) So (laughs) please include him in the list going forward. He would certainly win if he ran um, this year. (laughs) Um, yeah, and so that is, that's that. James Garfield, Assassination, 1881. Wow. Yeah, bonkers. Okay, this week I'm going to talk about the gunfight at the OK Corral. Wow. Oh, good. And good. this was the shootout in the Old West between some cowboys and Mm -hmm. sheriffs Uh, and it's the one that's probably become the most famous of all the shootouts uh, in the history of the American Old West Mm -hmm. and had some films made about it and that kind of thing so first of all to clear up a couple of things here's a question for you both okay okay do you think that a the gunfight took place at the OK Corral Mm -hmm. (laughs) or b the gunfight took place somewhere else because all of history and everyone is dumb and misrecords things (laughs) I think it was actually called the Good Corral, but after the shooting, the ratings went down. Went down. And it's just okay. Yeah, it was it's the like amazing three star, Corral. Yeah. Yeah. I think C, uh, it wasn't a gunfight. It was a water balloon fight. <laughs> I, yeah. You're both wrong. It was B. Oh, it was B. Oh, dang it. That's right. So because um, because everyone is, is so dumb. So despite the name, we all know it by today. Of course, the gunfight didn't take place uh, within or even next to the OK Corral, which was a horse livery, like horse corralling. So there was an OK Corral. There was an OK Corral. It was a horse livery place and a place where you corral horses. I don't know. Is that a thing? And, uh, I mean, yes, that's what a corral is. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, and I, I'm still not super clear what a corral is, actually. <laughs> I, so, so to be clear, I'm imagining fences with horses inside. Yeah. that so area. A horse yeah. horse field. Yeah, horse it's field. just a pen. It's like okay. a, a corral as a noun. Gunfight at the horse field. Is yeah, like, yeah gunfight no. at the horse. Saddle field. maker and horse field. I okay, think we cool. Can more, so it actually happened in a narrow lot on the side of C.S. Fly's photography studio, Ooh. about six doors west of uh, of the rear entrance of the place. So it should obviously be called um, the Gun- shootout just outside. <laughs> Gunfight CS Flies, at CS Flies a- photography alleyway studio. Photography, yeah. <laughs> so, so the background to this whole thing is that this was a period of general, re- really rapid expansion in the West uh, and, the, and the US, and there was loads of economic opportunity. So people were striking gold and silver, and there were settlers moving out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So- go on. Sorry, you just never hear about people striking silver. <laughs> well. <laughs> You will hear more in this story. Okay, good. I'm silver very was silver was the big thing. It there. was struck all over the place. It was. Yeah. It was. <laughs> and um, all of this was happening far more quickly than the state, which is to say, the central U.S. government could really govern or mm. any of it. Yeah. And so, as a result, of course, uh, was this lawlessness that took uh, took hold and isolated towns all over the place where there'd be no law enforcement presence at all for a long period of time. Yeah. And uh, and then, of course, that time period became known as the Wild West yeah. because you had these roaming gangs of people uh, making use of that freedom yeah aptly named <laughs> very aptly named. have you have you sorry have you already said where this was yes this is in the so this is in an area where silver was the thing that they struck rather than gold so this was in tombstone arizona oh cool Ooh. which was in arizona territory at the time which was about 30 miles from the mexican border and so a big part of the, all the lawlessness that was going on there was 
people um, stealing things in Mexico, selling them in north of the border, all that sort of stuff. And it was founded in March 1879, so only mm -hmm. two years before the period we're talking about. And uh, like many of these mi like mining boom towns, it grew really, really rapidly, so that by late 1881, the population was more than 7,000, which made mm. it the biggest, largest boom town in the Amer American Southwest at the time. But okay, hilariously, and also appallingly, uh, can you guess who is excluded from that population number of 7,000. <laughs> the Native Americans. Uh, absolutely, they're excluded. Yeah. Anyone else? Probably women. Yep, yeah. agreed. <laughs> Anyone else? Non-white people yep. in general. Yeah, correct. And and then another category? Catholics, probably. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Non-landowners? Um, no. So so the, the people, people without mustaches. <laughs> people who are excluded are all the people you've just said, basically. Mustaches included if they're American okay. men. But, but Chinese, Mexicans, women and children were yep. all excluded from well, the official sure. population count because... That's yeah, it's just yeah, kind of makes sense. Well, West. <laughs> yeah, Catholics good. Though. So like, okay, we got to plan something. We got to put a new bus route in. How many do we need it for? I don't know. Either seven thousand or fifty-five million, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the demographics. On who's going to ride don't count the bus? Them. Just grim. And um, so by the time of the shootout, which was in the in autumn 1881, there this place had just grown incredibly rapidly because of all the wealth that had come from striking silver, which was a thing. <laughs> <And> <laughs> second place. <laughs> I'm just glad I didn't strike bronze. <laughs> so there was in this town a bowling alley. Four Ooh. churches, Ooh. an ice house, don't know what that is, a school, <laughs> an opera house, two banks, three newspapers, an ice cream parlour, 110 saloons, <laughs> 14 God. gambling halls, and numerous brothels. 110 wow. saloons for 7,000 people, asterisk. <laughs> that's a lot. Right. That ratio is high. Yeah, that's like London pub ratio. But it actually is. sounds really fun. It's, yeah, super fun. Ice cream parlor, <laughs> ice, ice house. house. Yeah. Opera. Uh, skip that. <laughs> That's where the women can go. There must have been a really symbiotic, like, sort of relationship between the ice house and the ice cream parlor. Really, yeah. You know? Either that or just like mortal enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> there should be no flavor in it. it should be pure, <laughs> unadulterated water. <laughs> So the shootout took place, the shootout itself took place between some lawmen in the area of Tombstone and some outlaws. And can you guess the highly original name for the outlaws? It, it, I'm lying, by the way. It's not original. Is it the outlaws? <laughs> it's it's only very slightly more original. <laughs> the bad boys of Tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> it is the cowboys. Oh, oh okay. Okay, I, okay. I was going to go with like naughty kids or something. Yeah, like that, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah that also would be pretty great. <laughs> the cowboys. And, <laughs> and the reason. How do they distinguish them from like the legitimate cowboys that were just, yeah. you know, corralling cows? Or horses. Right. Or horses. Yeah. Well, then I think they horse were called boys, horse, horse boys. Horse, horse boys, sorry. Horse boys. Horse yeah. boys. <laughs> <laughs> the, the horse boys were going to participate, but they were all over at the ice house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason for the shootout was that there was a long running feud between these cowboys who included Billy Claiborne and the two brothers, Ike and Billy Clanton, and then the two McClory brothers. So that was the gang on one side. So those are the mm -hmm. outlaws, uh, the cowboys. And on the other side was the local gang of lawmen uh, who included uh, people called Virgil Earp, oh, who was yeah. the chief lawman in the town. And then he had two younger brothers, Morgan and Wyatt Earp, and then a temporary policeman called Doc Holliday. Uh, it's, oh, it's just he, so good. It's, it's great names. Uh, sidebar, I know I bring up a movie every time but have you guys seen tombstone no oh we oh. have to watch it it's like val kilmer is doc holiday oh, i think i have the seen herbs. it yeah, yeah i'm your huckleberry anyway it's great okay we've definitely got to watch that so, yeah. so erroneously though it turns out that they in the hollywood version of it the, the main characters kind of swapped so virgil Earp was actually the main guy in main charge dude. and okay. morgan's kind of been put in, in place for okay. in history but not that, that matters too much so i won't go into every last thing these cowboys did because they did so much to bring the law down on them but basically it included multiple murders stagecoach robberies hold-ups and just a complete tour of all the old west classics yeah, yeah. classic crimes classic crimes <laughs> <laughs> sounds great yeah they had so, they had an amazing fun they must have day. you know kicked so many people through the wooden you know, oh, the swinging yeah, doors. The swinging doors. Yeah. Yeah. So many bot like bot brown bottles Smashed broken off over a table. people's yeah, heads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
they had a great time for about 18 months. And then this happened. So um, on the day in question, the two sides then stumbled into one another and there are conflicting accounts of what happened and what's ended up being kind of codified, memorialised in the, in the Hollywood films and everything and, mm-hmm. made, and made the sort of conventional view of the history probably isn't really what happened at all. But no matter mm-hmm. what happened, it resulted in about 30 shots being fired in 30 seconds and they were about two metres from each other, these that's two a, groups. That's approximately so, one shot a second. That is... <laughs> yeah, hold on. Exactly, exactly yeah, that's right. right. That's what and I get said, too. Within two metres squared of each other. They were, so they were facing <laughs> off... Re- they are facing not two metres squared, all ten of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's really... That's dense. Like, someone needs to do the maths for bullets per square inch there. Like, that's 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 really high. How tall was the cube that they were shooting Okay, at? everyone stand in, in the square. Get in the square. Get in, in the square. Three, two, one, five. So the, uh, so the result was, unsurprisingly, at that close range, a bunch of people were killed and wounded. Yes. So the McClory brothers were both killed, and uh, as was Billy Clanton, on the baddie side. And then on the lawman side, they were all, there were a whole bunch of people wounded from them, but no one was killed. And it was just this wild, intense, crazy close-up <laughs> fight. Billy, Billy Clanton was Billy the Kid. No. Yes? No. Sorry. Okay. No. The thing is, at this point in America, everyone is named Billy. Oh, fine. <laughs> so <Okay. there's> like... <laughs> or Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's one or the other. <laughs> yeah, I, just, just another Billy. Okay, just another Billy. <laughs> yeah. And Billy then... the adult, probably. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result of all of this, uh, the feud didn't actually end there. So on, on December the 28th of that year, 1881, Virgil was then ambushed and maimed in another murder attempt by the Cowboys Ooh. as they sought retribution. And then they went back and killed Morgan the next year. So it just went on and on yeah, and on yeah. with all this crazy feudness. Uh, so there you have it, the gunfight at the OK Corral. That's wow. great. That's really good. Insane. I I like don't watch a lot of western, you know, old soul. J- J- uh, what's his name? John Wayne westerns yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I I'm not kidding. We will watch Tombstone. Okay. And listeners, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's great. Very nineties. Very nineties. Very nineties. Nineteen nineties, not eighteen nineties. Oh. So they're all wearing like shell suits. And... <laughs> yeah, they've all got like yeah, puka shells, puka shells and, uh, frosted, and tips. And frosted tips. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very weird when they take off their cowboy hats and they have frosted tips underneath, but it was historically accurate. Oh, they come into a bar and they shout out Waza at each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. <laughs> cool. Right, today I am going to take you on a trip through space and time. Ooh. Mm, not literally. No. Uh, we can't afford that. <laughs> the time travel <laughs> in particular. Uh, but what we're going to do is go to what is now modern day South Africa. Oh, I'm dying to go to South Africa. It is glorious there. It really is a beautiful yeah. place. Uh, not at this time, okay. which we'll cover off. Um, but we're going to be talking about the First Boer War. Oh. So uh, this is a series of skirmishes between the British Empire... And the people Boars. of the Boers. Oh, not uh, sorry. Can you spell Boer? B O E R S of not, modern day not South Africa. Wild pigs. So we all know who the British Empire are. Uh, you know, just <laughs> history's good guys. <laughs> 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 Never did anything wrong. Um, but who were the Boer? Uh, Boer simply means farmer in Dutch. That's what it is. Just just means farmer. Uh, and why Dutch? Well, uh, the south part of Africa was populated by European settlers, largely from the Netherlands, um, who were transplanted there and supported by the Dutch East India Company. And because the Cape of Good Hope was such an important point for trade, mm. and thus was seen as a very advantage to control it. And so you know, generations of people from the Netherlands coming over and they formed the, the Boer, uh, it was what they were. So the first lot of people were known as the Freeburgers, which I thought is just a great name. That's good. Uh, <laughs> and they were pretty successful in colonising the area, not least of all due to the fact that they prescribed to what was known as the Protestant work ethic. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, which is a really interesting sort of, there's a sort of a, a good way to spur people on when you say, you're more pious if you work really hard. Yeah. And thus people <laughs> did. That was a great, uh, a great ruse yeah, really for a couple was. of centuries yeah, there. Yeah, it worked for them. Um, and, and this has been happening in, in, in the south part of Africa since the 17th century. And by this stage in history now, where we're coming to, is there's about 1.5 million Dutch descendants there. So it's quite a large population of, of the Boer there. Enter the British, who commenced their colonisation of South Africa with the Cape Colony in 1806. Uh, and they did what they did best, you know, established forts, uh, war in practical red tunics and just, you know, pissing off the locals, really. 
Um, and tea. They drank a lot of tea. They drank That's a lot right. of tea. Uh, and they chased the Dutch forces out in 1815 after the Napoleonic Wars. So they trounced the French. The Dutch weren't able to stand up to them. And they managed to sort of annex, effectively, the, the Cape. Good riddance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, they, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Uh, they wanted to control the trade routes, uh, as British Emperor always does. And they wanted to keep on top of the general rush and the glut of Europeans, you know, colonising Africa. They were competing against the Portuguese, the Germans, the Belgians, the French, and like just, just anyone that, you know, wasn't from Africa. Yeah, yeah. Like was just pouring in there to try and like pillage the place. So by 1877, the British had annexed what they called Transvaal. So Transvaal is kind of the sort of South African part of modern day South Africa um, because Transvaal had you know numerous problems with, with finances and so the British nobly came in and, and took over. Um, <laughs> it's a bailout. <laughs> it's a bailout. Um, so on the one hand, you had this fiercely independent, hardworking Dutch descendants who viewed themselves as pioneers. Uh, and on the other hand, you have these like just... <laughs> Just, just hoity toity tight arse Brits <laughs> <laughs> with all their rules and wigs and, you know, whatnot and that kind of stuff. Sorry, is that wigs W I G S or W H I G S? Both. Both, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the Boer were sick of being tread on, I think is the kind of yeah. summary. Yeah. <laughs> and so they pushed north. They said, like, you know, forget this. We're not going to stick around the south with, with the British in, in, in charge. Yeah. Let's go north. And so they did. And they undertook what's called the Great Trek, uh, which was to avoid Cape Town and the British. And they migrated north, uh, north of South Africa, but still in modern day South Africa. And uh, they sort of set up their own sort of states, as it were. And they were recognised by the British because they said, we don't need to have anything. You've got nothing of value there. You know, you can have your nomadic lifestyles or whatever it is you want to do. Um, and at the Sand River Convention in 1852, and again in the Bloemfontein Convention of 1854, they ratified their existence and say, yes, you have your own authority. And you The British the said The British said yes. this to, the, to, the, to, the, to them. Wow, yes. that was incredibly clever. Because presumably we didn't want their yeah, land yet. Nothing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a little bit of like a, <laughs> yeah, 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 you, that's your land. For now. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, these definitely were great treaties uh, to ensure the peace between the people and were totally ironclad. <laughs> yes, of and course. set in stone <laughs> right up yeah, here we go. until the point that a huge deposit of diamonds uh-huh. were discovered in 1867. I always get you. They struck diamonds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they struck diamond even better than silver. Um, so the Boers' isolationism, unfortunately, just couldn't last, could it? Yeah. Really couldn't. And uh, those were clearly empire diamonds. They just didn't know it yet. Yeah. And a series of annexations and areas taken under control by the British creeping towards these areas Mm. um, start to encroach upon the Boer. Um, Enter one, great name, Sir Theophilus, I'll say this again. (laughs) Enter one, Sir Theophilus Shepstone. Great name. Ooh. Theophilus Shepstone. Shepstone. That's very and good. And he was sent in to push this political agenda of the British even more. And he actually, decl- he's the one that declares the annexation of Transvaal, like in spite of them saying we're never going to do this, the treaties. <laughs> um, and this is definitely not like with the consent of most the Transvaal bore. And also like, at no point so far have we mentioned any of the native peoples yeah. whatsoever. Oh, no, yeah. no, oh, oh, no, no, no. Like these basically, they're not is, at all yeah, featuring. Okay. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's just, just two European people just happened to be trampling upon. But the Dutch, uh, the Dutch we're, were like there for like two generations yes, or something, yeah, yeah. to be and, fair on them, but, like, but and not so for hundreds of years. The, yeah. there, there is stuff that goes on that during the war, for example, the British persecuted the, 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 you know, the native Africans for helping the Boer and the Boer right. would often trade with and get support from. And uh. So like there was, there was some symbiosis and some like embedding in cultures and stuff. Um, but anyway, the Transvaal Board didn't want this. The People's Council, which was effectively, as far as I can tell, like a puppet of the British Empire. <laughs> what? Um, With a name like the People's <laughs> yeah. Council? Uh, they did, They put out a, a writ saying, uh, even though you hate this, please don't commit acts of violence as this could create a negative image of the Transvaal in Britain. <laughs> oh. Which, you know, we must avoid. <laughs> um, you know, it's real peace in our time stuff, I think, to be honest. Um, enter now the total baddie of our story, so prepare your booze, uh, Major General Sir George Pomeroy Colley. Nice. Ooh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, so, he, you know, today, even in a movie, he would be played by some scrawny, untrustworthy-looking dude with a tiny <laughs> like moustache. Like a curly moustache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just absolutely, just not the guy you'd want to talk to or trust at a party. Um, 
He... <laughs> <laughs> in, in a movie today, he would be played by Will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was the governor in placed in Transvaal when the Boers revolted on the 11th of November. Uh, and this was caused when a Boer named Pete... Mm, the second name is begins with a B. Okay, so Pete, 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 Pete B. Pete B. I don't think I can pronounce that. He, <laughs> but he refused to pay an illegally inflated tax. And so the government officials seized his wagon and then put it up for auction. Uh, but at that auction, a hundred armed boar came along, disrupted proceedings. They assaulted the officials and reclaimed the wagon. Uh, government troops were brought in to sort of quell this, you know, uh, act of aggression. And they, they fought back. Fought back, and this meant that the first Boer War was off to the races with right. shots fired. Wagon. Yeah, over a, a, a wagon. And also, you know, just, you know, systematic. All the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, But exactly. mostly over a wagon. <laughs> yeah, systematic oppression. Um, now, when we say war, the first Boer War is really a kind of a series of smaller skirmishes over 10 weeks. Um, so it's not massive amounts of casualties. There are some. Um, we're going to go into more detail on that, but not like full scale. Like the Second Boer War was yeah. was even more aggressive. Okay. Um, the Boer didn't have an army though, which is like kind of the thing you need for a war, really. Usually, it's encouraged. But what what they did have was a series of local militias. Oh, so, I thought you were going to say what they did have was gumption. Gu- they did have gumption. <laughs> they definitely had gumption, and they formed themselves loosely into what they called commandos. Okay. So they just elect someone they thought was good as the officer for this local commando. And they were very much like guerrilla warfare. These were like hardy men of the land. They lived on their horses. They ate what they killed. <laughs> so they had to be good at shooting. Yeah. And so they were just this really efficient people. They're super hardy. And they spent all their lives in the saddle. And they dressed in just regular farmer attire of, you know, khakis and tunics and... Uh, and assless and chaps. Ass- <laughs> assless chaps. And then on the other side, you have the British troops in like bright red tunics. Assful in- chaps. And now, I don't know if you... <laughs> Ass- <laughs> they're chaps and so much. <laughs> and they're just trousers. <laughs> they're assful yeah. chaps. <laughs> but like the- I like to call them assful chaps. Like just picture like, you know... S- South Africa in the sort of tones and colours there and standing in at these <laughs> idiots with massive feathered hat caps and red tunics. Like, they yeah. were just absolute sitting ducks. But style uh, over substance, Ant. And, <laughs> yeah, true. Um, and the difference between their sort of tactics is fascinating because the British obviously prided themselves in discipline and coordinated fire and unit manoeuvre in lines and squares, etc., and, and the Boer were just extremely mobile and they were this skirmishing light cavalry on, on horseback and were able to just dance around and able, because of their superior skills yeah. with sharpshooting, like British army soldiers would never really train firing single hand. So like they didn't know how good a shot they were. They just line up in a line of 20 of them and then shoot in the same direction. And you're, somebody's going to hit Someone's somebody. Someone's going to hit somebody. Yeah. Whereas the Boer, like they're shooting, you know, squirrels out of trees and uh-huh. what, what have you. Um, and so they were able to pick off these officers from afar. And the British Army just weren't able to keep up with this insurgency-style tactic um, and this guerrilla warfare campaign. And they did rest too much on squirrels in retrospect. <laughs> they, 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 they shot all the officer squirrels <laughs> straight away. Yeah. I mean, the, the, what's the saying? A, a, a British officer is not a man without a squirrel. That's right. That's yeah. what they say. That's, that came from this. That's This is exactly where okay. that came from, yeah. that saying about the squirrels. As an example, in the first sort of larger scale battle, um, the commanding officer and some 120 men of the 94th foot were killed or wounded within a minute. Uh, and wow. on the Boer side, they had two killed and five wounded. Wow. So that just shows the absolute decimation of the tactics, yeah, the Jesus. skill, the agility. Um, and, and at the same time, the Boer also laid siege to the six British forts so they couldn't sort of reinforce and have that sort of manoeuvre. This reflected in the outcome of the three sort of main battles where time and time again, Boer sharpshooters just decimated the chain of command and caused havoc at range. Um, one such battle, the sort of one of the more famous one, is is the Battle of Majuba Hill, and it is one of the British worst defeats militarily. Mm. I've never heard of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't teach it. <laughs> but, it doesn't exist in the history that Will subscribes. Yeah, exactly. To. It was this in eighteen eighty one. Still, or are we? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 And and this uh, they took the high ground with about four hundred men. The British did, and Collie was there leading them. And the Brits... So everything's fine. Uh, everything's fine. The, 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 exactly. The British uh, troops um, taunted the boar that were in the valley. Like, oh. you're, in, you're in a terrible valley below. We're going to rain down fire upon you. And then they sort of didn't know kind of where they went because the boar were able to use the dead ground and just sneak up um, through the valleys and culverts to the top. And um, 
Within 30 minutes, they had killed Collie with a sharpshooter and drove the British fleeing in panic off the hill. Wow. And it was an utter shambolic embarrassment for the British army. Um, and in sixth, as a result of this, on the 6th of March, 1881, a truce was declared and the British agreed to complete Boer self-government in the Transvaal, uh, but they were still under a British suzerainty, which is... Uh, suzerainty. S- what's, it, what's the word? Suzerainty, I think. Suzerainty, thank you, that's the one. Um, which means that they control everything internally, but any foreign affairs were handed to the British. Uh, you know, it's just notional at this stage, right? Um, so that was the end of the British interest in South Africa uh, <laughs> for 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until 1886, 1886, when massive gold deposits were found. Oh, God. <laughs> and that would then go on to kick off the Second Boer War. Uh, but we aren't going to talk about that today. And that was a very different story, very different scale, and, yeah. and some very terrible, terrible things happened. The only thing, this is true, the only thing I knew about the Boer War before today is that um, Lord Grantham from Downton Abbey fought in it. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one that ran is away that in true? the hill. Is that the <laughs> sense of your knowledge? Yeah. yeah. And wow. then I knew it was in South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> well, that's me. Okay. Wow. God, the 1880s were wild. <laughs> Super wild. Cowboys. Yeah. Cowboys, boars. Boar boys. <laughs> all, man- all manner of... Um, Alligator politicians. Minerals. Officer squirrels. Officer squirrels. <laughs> Officer squirrels. <laughs> We've learned so much. <laughs> Great stuff. Great stuff, 1881. You did us proud. Thanks for joining us. That's everything you'd ever need to know about the year 1881. That's it. That's uh, it. That's it. That's it. That's it. We've said that several <laughs> times. <now. laughs> so, so, Will, considering that's it, um, that's can, it. <laughs> can you please boot up the random number generator? But that's not all. <laughs> no, that is all. That is all. Okay. Uh, yes, I can. And as a reminder, we've set the random number generator as per our strict instructions that we're under yep. mm-hmm. to select a year between. 1000 BCE and 2000 CE and next week's year will be 1632. Wow. 1632. We've had 1629. Oh, have we? Yeah, that was our first okay. ever episode was 1629. Oh. Do you think the RNG is trying to like get us to hone in on something that happened in like 1631? <laughs> and it's like closer, closer. You can try it likes. So I will not be honed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you will and you'll like it. Okay. Do not do not insult the RNG like that. 1632. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. 1632. Great. Here we go. See you then. That's See you it. Week. That's it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.